Ms. Kalimali is going to talk to us about Passive DNS uh, as a source of actionable security data. Please, Ms. Molly, the floor is yours. So, okay. good morning, buenos dias. Um, my name is Kelly Malloy, and I'm from Farsight Security, and I have inferior equipment today. Um, uh, before I get started, I'd just like to say that this is my first time in South America and I went out and explored a little bit yesterday, and this is a very beautiful city. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> uh, my role at Farsight, I'm a senior program manager, which means that I am in charge of data acquisition. So um, all the passive DNS sensors that come into our organization are under my management. Um, previously, some people still know me from uh, from these roles. I was uh, I managed SpamCop and SenderBase, the reputation products for Cisco. Um, I worked at ReturnPath, um, carrying on the work that JD Falk did. If any of you know JD or knew JD, um, and before that, I worked at the original Maps RBL, and I managed all the lists and was the one who answered the phone and got death threats and things like that back when people were really mad about network filtering. Um, my areas of expertise are DNSBLs, spam traps, and collection and management and dissemination of reputation data. And I have my contact information there. Um, please feel free to email me or call me or DM me on Twitter, whatever is most convenient for you. Oh, and before I get started, um, just please, uh, if you have any questions, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, but if there's something that's unclear, feel free to you know let me know and I'll do what I can to clarify during the presentation. Um, Farsight Security was founded in two years ago, um, uh, two years and a couple months, by Paul Vixie and Paul Nakapetras, who, as you probably know, are instrumental in the creation and formation of DNS as it is today. Um, what we do is we offer real-time passive DNS solutions, um, and what we try to do is use the DNS, the passive DNS information that we collect to provide context for SIEMs, other threat intelligence data. We give you more information so you can make better judgments about what to do with that data. Um, our products are the Security Information Exchange, which we acquired from ISC. Um, and I think, I think many people are familiar with SIE. Um, and we have specialty channels under there for DNS errors, DNS changes, and X, NX domains. So you can separate those out, get those as a part of the feed or separately if you wish. Um, we also have DNSDB, which is a historical database of passive DNS. And we have two new products called Newly Observed Domains and Newly Observed Host Names. And Newly Observed Domains are just that. They are domains that have shown up. Uh, this is, they're listed when we see the first query in Passive DNS to the domain name and it resolves. Um, they, you're welcome to use them any way you wish. Um, Paul Vixie likes to say that he finds that um, Newly observed domains is a good way to uh, hold a new domain that is probably illegitimate, um, you know, under the water until it stops struggling, and then it's okay to uh, to accept more data from. Newly observed host names is the same thing. So about passive DNS, does anybody? How many of you are familiar with the concept of passive DNS? Okay. Passive DNS is just, we just record the answers to queries and we store them in a database. Um, it is a retrospective map of DNS. It's very useful in, help, in better understanding and interpreting what your other security systems will tell you if you go look at you know, threat data, 
say you get an IP and you look and you see that it's a newly observed uh, domain name or host name and you see that it, it hasn't resolved before and then you keep looking and looking and looking, you can block with confidence and minimize your collateral damage. And it also is useful because I know that uh, one of the issues that people had with DNSBLs is they would see one hit in like a slash 24 and they would take out the whole slash 24. They would block the entire slash 24. That was often not the optimal solution because that resulted in a lot of good mail and good traffic being blocked. So when you have more context, you can make better blocking or filtering decisions. So our related product is DNSDB. And DNSDB, um, after we collect them via passive DNS sensors, individual DNS records, we store them in a database. It's a MySQL database. There's nothing fancy about it. You don't, you know, it's just, it's easy to query, easy to use. Um, and that's our database of records. It goes back to 2010 now. So we have historical data on much of the internet. I will tell you now that we do not have as much coverage in South America as I would like. And if anyone would like to run a passive DNS sensor for us, um, I can help you get that set up, and in exchange, we would give you a subscription to DNSDB, so you can use the API um, to query the database about domain names and IPs. So this is a little diagram that will show you, illustrate better how that works. Um, we take in the raw passive DNS data, uh, we filter out what's the errors in NX domains to a separate channel, um, then we verify the DNS data by looking at, by matching queries, corroborating among queries so that we know that it's not a one-off mistake. Um, things that have changed recently go to the DNS changes channel and things that are new go to new leaves or host names. So is that clear as mud? Um, and then this explains a little bit about the relationship between SIE and DNSDB. Um, we have sensors between the authority servers and the, the uh, recursive servers. A passive DNS installation requires a little bit of our code on your recursives, and you're welcome to look at that code if you wish. Um, and we take third-party threat data from other information exchanges, um, and that goes into security information, to SIE, Security Information Exchange, and we, um, we and that gives you real-time intelligence. Um, when we dedupe and clean it up, then, um, we send that to DNSDB. Some of the things that we filter out in that process are like DNSBL queries if they're redundant. Um, you don't need, you know, 10,000 queries to spam house about the same IP. That's just one is good enough for that purpose. Um, so DNSDB is kind of a, a groomed version of the, of the passive DNS data. So our customers right now include um, security, financial technology, retail companies. Um, they, uh, since the Target breach is, are you guys aware of the Target breach? Target stores were in the US, which is like a big department store, were breached in at the end of 2014 and they got in through the billing systems of a uh, contractor and they leveraged the access to steal personal data from millions of Target customers. I had to have my credit card reissued because of that. Um, academia, researchers, law enforcement. And this is a, a good time to mention that if you are a student or doing bona fide research, we will give you a license to DNSDB for the, for the time of your research or, or the time that you're in school. Um, and if, if you are interested in that, send me an email. Um, 
Most of our security customers use DNSDB, which has collected passive DNS data since 2010. And it looks, you can do this to expand information on IOCs, suspicious IP addresses, domain names that look dodgy. It's a good way to find snowshoe domains. And so some of the things we can learn from passive DNS, we can find where this domain pointed to in the past. Um, have they been moving among networks? Um, what domain names accept traffic on a given mail server? That's useful because if you block an IP because it has one bad mail server on it, you may block all of Rackspace's outgoing customers or uh, GoDaddy's outgoing customers, and that can be, um, I just heard about somebody who did that with OVH and ended up missing a lot of good mail, and it was a painful experience for his company. Um, you can also see um, what domain names point to a single IP. Like, if are there 40,000 domain names that resolve to this IP? Then, you know, that's, that's a useful piece of information. Um, or if they resolve to a, a, a network, that is also useful as well. Um, and the thing that I find to be very useful is to look at what subdomains exist below a base domain name. And that's great for finding out if this is, if I see, if I see a nonsense word, like a string of letters and numbers, alphanumeric string, um, domain, Dot TLD, I, I know that that's probably, while the rest of the company may be legit, the rest of the network may be legit, that is probably a rogue host name on their network or subdomain on their network. Um, and the thing is that in our experience, passive DNS has been very good at finding ba network badness. We can find, we can give context to intrusion attempts, we can uh, we can take out whole networks if necessary um, by looking back in passive DNS and looking at the larger collection. It's been very useful. I used it a lot when I was at um, Senderbase because it validated a lot of my a lot of my hunches, um, shall we say? And DNSDB is growing every day. And the seven billion number comes from September 1st, so it's probably out of date by now. Um, it's probably more like seven and a half billion. We uh, have historical views of the configuration and content of global DNS, including the first scene and the last scene. So that gives you some idea of how long it's persisted on the network. Um, you can discover unknown host names, which as I explained are is useful and it's um, we index um, RDNS very uh, quickly so you can find what you need it's not burdensome it's very lightweight and then um, IOCs which are an indicator of compromise I don't know if that's that's what I have always heard in the industry I don't know if that's a widely used term, does everybody know what that means? Okay. Um, so you identify your IOC either uh, through your SIEM device or a trusted informa information sharing relationship like Threat Exchange or something like that. And what you usually find in an IOC is an IP address, an FQDN, and a hash. We're not really going to talk about the hash because the hash doesn't really, isn't useful to us in this context. It's useful in other contexts, but not this one. So we can look and see what else can we find out about that IOC. So we can check their current DNS. We can check the who is and the IP address who is. We can look in route views and see who is currently routing the IP. We can check passive DNS and we can overlay other information on the domain or IP, like looking at domain reputation through something like Serbal or Senderbase or Senderscore, um, and IP reputation 
also, is it listed in a DNSBL? Is it listed in uh, Spam House? Um, is it a on the drop list, the Spam House drop list? And so uh, people say, well, what is this? What good is this going to do me? Why should I collect all this information? Um, it's useful because it discovers clues regarding the attacker's identity. And I have found, especially when I worked at um, Maps and Cinderbase, that one of the things that was very useful was to find all the domains that belong to a certain registrant. And if one was bad, I could be fairly confident that all of them were bad, looking back at data. And if I see them moving around in DNSDB, if I see them hopping from network to network, that shows me that you know a bad actor is not very long-lived on any responsible network operator's uh, network. Um, it also helps me automate my complaints. I know who to notify or complain to, and often I know who to call. Um, if I know that something is coming from OVH, I know who to call. If I know that it's coming from Rackspace, I know who to call. And that is a, a very effective way to get things turned off. Um, you can look for other similar domains. A lot of snowshoers will register long alphanumeric strings and vary them by one on each iteration and register 500. And they count on being able to get mail out of them before, uh, before they actually have to pay for the domain, before the tra transaction actually concludes. And then they get terminated for abuse, but they don't really care because they've already spammed from the domain. Um, and it helps you avoid collateral damage. If you block an IP that hosts a few domains, your risk of collateral damage is much less than risking a, than blocking a domain that has 10,000 domains on it. Um, and in some applications, some, some networks, some companies don't really care about collateral damage, but other places are extremely sensitive to that. If you block email from a network and you lose a sales lead, people may go ballistic, at least in my experience. Not that I've ever done that. Um, so when, you've, when you have the IP address and you've con contextualized it, um, you can use passive DNS to look at the related domains. And you can look for the PTRs and ADDRs that reflect IP ownership. So if they all belong to the same entity, that's a useful piece of information to know. Um, you can find about associated countries, like do they have the same domain name in the US and in Canada and in Europe and in Brazil and in Australia in, and in China? And do you want to score those down in a reputation system or a blocking system? Or do you want to let each, each entity stand alone? That's up to you. Um, it also gives you clues as to how the DNS is being used or how the IP is being used, rather. Um, is it being used as a mail server? Is it being used as you know, an end user dynamic IP? Is it a web server? What is it? Is it a DNS server? It gives you a lot of, a lot of uh, context for that. But these are all clues. And you can't regard any one thing as dispositive. Um, because some of these are forged, can be forged, like PTR records, or can be used to mislead. So the more data points you have, the more confident you can be that you're making a good decision. So some of the clues that we look for um, as potential indicators of maliciousness are known cracking malware or spam-related sites. If it's listed in Threat Exchange, if it's listed in um, the CBL, or if it's listed in a DNSBL, that's a big red flag. Um, Lookalike phishing domain names. Um, I routinely run queries for uh, domains that are one-off, uh, Viagra or Cialis, um, and you'll see them with the I for the, or an L for the I, or a number one for the I, and those I don't ever need to talk to. Um, random or, or computer-generated domain names, and uh, LEET, 
Uh, I had, for a while, I owned 1337.net, and uh, nobody ever accept, <laughs> accepted any traffic from that domain. It was not uh, a useful registration on my part. Um, in terms of things that, that should throw up, those are, are very strong indicators of maliciousness. Um, if you, other data points that you can consider, um, are there lots of domains? Because that may mean lots of collateral damage. And if you see even one, like Alexa 1000 domain, um, you know, it, if you look at, if there's a, 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 a host name in there, a, a resolver, um, if you see major government or education sites, then maybe you want to back off and be more granular, more careful in your blocking or filtering decisions. So here's an example. Um, so in our logs, we see a failed password for root from the IP, and, we, and it's SSH, and they tried three times. So we look at the DRG SSH password list, and we look You can see there, it's um, from ChinaNet. We can look at the date, um, when it was last seen, and uh, a lot of people would block that IP on site for that alone. Um, and I wouldn't blame them a bit. And everybody knows about the SSH password insight list, right? That's an extremely useful resource. And if you don't use it, I would suggest that you do. And so then if we go look in DNS or uh, who is, we don't see very much. There's no PTR. Um, if we dig, there's nothing. And if we look at the who is information, it doesn't really give us a description of a particular actor. It just tells us it's China Net, China Telecom. So if we look at passive DNS, we see that there have only been two FQDNs on that IP. Neither of them look, to, to me at least, like domains that I would need to accept traffic from. I, I don't know that I ever get much useful traffic from a domain that starts with buy. Um, so if I look farther and I look at the first most recent um, domain name, and I look through that. Um, I see uh, that we've only had five hits from that, which in a network of our size is very small. And they all came on the same day. So that tells me that they're probably not using, they're, they're probably snowshoeing, they're probably rotating through IP addresses very quickly. So um, the conclusion that I would derive from that is that it's safe to block at least SSH access. And if it were my network, I would block all traffic. I mean, I'd block them at the routers. Um, and I would, it would be very unlikely. I would not expect to see any collateral damage from that. So then if I think, you know, if that's a bad guy, maybe he has bad neighbors too. So if I do a who is on that, this is not who is output that inspires confidence. If I look at that, um, it's not a conforming uh, phone number. The, um, the information is vague. Some of it is just plain wrong. This is not a person who cares a lot about maintaining a good reputation here is the conclusion that I would draw personally. And the other domain is equally low grade and it uses the same email address, which is a very useful indicator of relatedness. So other things that we can do is we can look at the entire CIDR block around an IP of interest. If I look and I see nothing but cruft in an entire slash 24, I might as well take out the whole thing, whether they've attacked me not or not, um, you know, prevention. 
And that lets me know that that's probably a bigger entity than just one bad guy. It's not an individual, um, an individual one-off IP. You didn't just, you know, loan that IP to somebody bad. It's a network of badness. Um, if I look for additional domain names on the same name server or on the same name server's IP address, that is often very useful and very enlightening. Um, it's very useful when it comes to tracking botnets. Um, you can follow the FQDN if you guys have ever seen those things where uh, you have the music video and the word is on, the, the lyrics are on the bottom and it bounces. You can literally watch domains do that through networks. Um, and it will hop from one botted IP to another, to another, to another. And it's actually, if, you're, if you don't get out much like me, that can actually be quite entertaining. Um, you can either do, do this through a web GUI or you can integrate passive DNS into your code and get the output in whatever format you prefer or is most useful to you. If you would prefer to have it in a CSV, we can do that for you. We can help you with that. Um, you can also limit your results to just one record type, or you can limit your results by time range or bailiwick. So what we've learned from this is that when an anomaly is seen, um, security practitioners should use passive DNS to do deeper investigation, um, and it, that helps you determine what the threat is and what l new threats are likely to come from that network. And that can lead to the creation of new IOCs. Um, most of our security users use the DNSDB web UI because it's easy to use and you don't really need any training to use it. If you've used any kind of query tool in the past, it should be pretty intuitive. Um, there's also API and export. Export is very large, I will tell you that. It is a large data set. If you are concerned about bandwidth, that is not the, the version for you. And uh, once again, my contact information and uh, any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Molly. And uh, I wish uh, we could have questions. If anyone have questions, we can take the the microphone. Hi, hi. I didn't know about about the project, uh, but I want to know if there is. Uh, information that you provide as a feed for anyone who, who wants to use that? Uh, we can provide this as a feed. If you contribute a sensor, okay. if you run a sensor, you can have DNSDB for free. Okay, thanks. Yeah. More questions? And also, if you're a student or a researcher, we can also give you access to DNSDB as well. Any more questions? Okay, so I have to thank you very much, okay. Kelly, for your help. Let me help you with this. Thank you.